What was the universe like before sin? Did plants and animals die before Adam sinned at a time when God referred to his creation as very good? And if not, when did they start dying? And what are the scientific and theological implications? We'll talk about it today on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. I'm Richard Fangrad. And I'm Thomas Bailey. The specific question we're looking at today is, was there animal death before Adam's sin? Right, yeah, an important question. Uh, some Christians believe that animals lived and died for many millions of years before mankind arrived on the scene. And why is that? Because they believed what they've been taught in schools right. and by the media, that fossils found in sedimentary rocks throughout the world were formed over millions of years long before Adam. Right, and now, now one of the inconsistencies with that view is that millions of years of disease and decay and violent death, because that's what's in the fossil record, yep. those things existed when God declared that all he had made was very good on the last day of creation week. Right, now so, in that case, you end up with a picture that looks like this. The Garden of Eden yeah. with Adam and Eve there, they're sitting on top of millions of years worth of death, bloodshed, and disease. Yeah, yuck. Um, God does not describe disease, decay, and death as very good. No. There's the inconsistency, right? And that's what we'll be discussing today. Now, to get around that inconsistency, these Christians claim that the warning about death given to Adam, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die, did not apply to animals, that the curse of, of physical death pronounced by God on Adam in Genesis 3, 17 to 19, was for human death only and not animals like lions and cattle. Right, okay. Now, that doesn't help because the oldest modern human fossils, truly human, like so Homo sapiens mm -hmm. here, are dated at more than 200,000 years old, wow. if yeah. you go with the, the old Earth time frame. Right. That's long before Adam. It doesn't work. Anyways. They go on to claim that carnivory, animals eating other animals, which is shown in the fossil record, was the original nature of these animals mm. and isn't mm. inconsistent with the very good creation that, that God made. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a big stretch to defend a claim is. that the evidence of disease like cancer on dinosaur bones uh, or death found in the fossil record is consistent with a very good creation. If so, the word good must mean something different to these folks than it does to God. That's true, yeah. Today we'll consider the following. God declared everything he had made very good. Plants were the original food God supplied to animals and people. We'll look at a biblical definition of what it means for something to be alive and a biblical definition of death. We'll also look at why living things die, and we'll look at when fossils formed. We'll look at all of these within the question of whether or not animals died before Adam sinned. Right. And then we'll consider the implications for geology and paleontology. Okay, let's begin where God begins his account with uh, what he tells us in the opening chapter of Genesis. Good we idea. read there that after each day's act of creating, God declared what he'd made to be good. Uh, the light, for example, that's the first thing there in Genesis 1 verse 4 the separation of the waters in verse 7. The pattern continues with dry land and vegetation on the third day, the sun, moon, and stars on the fourth day, the sea and flying creatures on the fifth day, and land beasts on the sixth day. Then, after God had completed readying the world as mankind's home and created Adam and Eve, we read, And God saw everything he had made, and behold, it was very good. Yeah, now the big question is, what does very good mean? Well, it certainly means that the creation was magnificent in its beauty. Sure. But does it mean that lions didn't eat antelopes for lunch? Yeah, well, the most reasonable deduction from God's word is that animals did not eat other animals. Right. Uh, for example, God said to Adam and Eve, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. So basically, eat plants. Yeah. <laughs> and then in verse 30, God continues, And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, 
everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. Hold on a second. Now, some people who believe in animal death before Adam's sin claim that the provision of plants for food is permissive, but not exclusive. They argue that what God has not prohibited, he permits. Right, okay. Now, if, if that is right, then God's covenant with Noah after the flood, where God then allows him to eat meat, makes no sense right. if Noah already had permission to eat yeah. meat. <laughs> the Bible teaches that Adam and Eve and the animals, when they were created, were all vegetarians. None of the animals were carnivores. Yeah, so that means that lions didn't eat antelopes right. for lunch. <laughs> At the beginning, everything was beautiful. Every animal was tame and didn't eat other animals, and the garden was full of fruit to eat. Sounds like a paradise. Hey. Oh, hey, it was. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. You didn't need to worry about being attacked by wild animals or bitten by poisonous right. snakes or, or, or pricked by thorns even. It can be deduced from Scripture that there was no danger, disease, decay, or death. Wait a minute. Does this mean that Eve couldn't have come down with a cold or have a runny nose or Adam couldn't have stubbed his toe while working in the Garden of Eden? Well, that's right, and we'll add more details shortly. Many people think that the biblical flood of Noah was abandoned because of the evidence. However, history tells a different story. Modern geological thought owes much to a man named Charles Lyell. Lyell, a lawyer, published a book in 1830 called Principles of Geology. Described as a masterpiece of persuasion, it changed the way people thought about Earth's past. According to Lyell, we should only appeal to today's geological processes to explain Earth history. However, this approach meant that the global flood recorded in the Bible was automatically ruled out of consideration. Lyell wanted, he wrote, to free the science of geology from Moses. Regrettably, many people have uncritically adopted Lyell's philosophy without considering how Noah's flood can help us understand Earth history. Lyell changed the way many people think, but his approach was motivated by his anti-biblical philosophy. Indeed, it is very difficult to explain Earth's history without Noah's flood. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. So no colds, no cancer, and no toe stubbing in the world before sin. That's right. Yeah, Eve wouldn't have gotten sick. Uh, Adam couldn't be hurt or experience pain. Now, naturally, we wonder, how is that possible? Right. right. It's very hard to imagine <laughs> it given is. the world that yeah, we live in. For sure. And we can't go back and test or observe it. Nope. That very good world doesn't exist anymore. What we can do is pay close attention to the description of it in the Bible. Yes. Now, it may be that the nature of physics was a little bit different before Maybe. Adam's sin, or that the protective angels were very active. Mm -hmm. uh, we read about their work, for example, in Psalm 91. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. So, very interesting. We can also look at how the new creation will operate since it is to be a restoration of sorts right. back to the original very good world. In Isaiah 11.6, the prophet reveals that God promises to restore this paradise to earth in the future, including its lack of predation, by promising, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't happen right now. <laughs> if it no. does, it doesn't end up well with uh, the lamb. <laughs> And the leopard shall lie down with the young goat and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. Now, that paints a picture of a world that's very different yeah. than our own, right? And commentators say that Isaiah was making an allusion to the pre-fall world. Right. And he goes on to summarize this future state, they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. And again, this is very unlike our current world with animals ripping each other up. Right. Now, we can be sure that in the new physical heavens and earth, there will be no more death, no crying or pain, based on how John describes it in Revelation. Chapter 21 begins, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And in verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from the throne, saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. That's just like it was uh, before sin when God walked in the garden with yes, Adam and Eve. nice. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. 
Okay, so an apple won't fall on Isaac Newton's head while he's sitting under a tree in the new creation? <laughs> well, it might, <laughs> but it wouldn't cause pain. I'm right. Not sure right. if it really caused him pain anyway, <laughs> if that account even happened. Yeah, yeah, probably not. Yeah. Uh, since we know that God will prepare a, a, a place, a new paradise, where his people will dwell with him forever Amen. in perfect safety, he would have had no difficulty making the first paradise just as safe. Right. right. Now, this highlights another inconsistency with the idea of animal death going on for millions of years before sin. If the new earth is to be a restoration back to the very good world, yes, that's not a restoration I'd be too excited about. <laughs> no. Um, restored back to what? A world of violent death and diseases uh, and pain and poisonous plants and animals? No thanks. Yeah. No, the, the original creation was different than it is today. A massive change happened when Adam sinned. God, through the Apostle Paul, tells us that beginning with Adam's sin, the created order has been deteriorating. That's right, yeah. Uh, uh, Paul says, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. Now that's referring to God here, cursing the creation as a result of Adam's sin. So it's no longer very good at that point. In hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Amen. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Yep. The universe we now live in is decaying rapidly toward heat death. Yeah. Uh, according to the second law of thermodynamics, which coincidentally is one of the arguments for why the universe must have had a beginning. That's right, yeah. So the Bible gives us a picture here of a beautiful world before sin. There was no death of people or animals. Right. Now let's bring that picture into sharper focus. What about plants? Yes, aren't they alive and didn't they die? Or didn't at least parts of them die when Adam and Eve ate their breakfast? That's the question. Yeah. Or if Adam pruned a grapevine, for instance. Yeah, now clearly we need to define death, what it means to die, but before we define death, we, we really need to define life, yeah, right? Makes something sense, can't yeah. die if it's not alive. So, so what does it mean for something, something to be alive in the, in the biblical sense now? Now, defining life can get complicated. We can start by looking at it from a biological perspective. Something is biologically alive if it has processes like this. Metabolism, that involves converting food to energy for performing work. Homeostasis is where an organism maintains internal variables, mostly in response to external or environmental changes. For example, the pancreas produces insulin to maintain blood sugar level. Growth, an acorn becomes an oak tree. Stimuli response, pulling a hand away from a hot stove. Movement, walking to the kitchen to get a drink of water. Signaling or communication, a nod of recognition, or a baby crying because she's hungry. Reproduction, birth of a baby. But this can only give a, a kind of a rough definition of life, because after all, God is alive, right? That's, yeah. Uh, as he declares, for example, in Psalm 42.2 and John 6.57. That's right, and angels are alive, but a number of the processes identified in this table don't apply to them. Right, yeah, so far, uh, our understanding of what it means for something to be alive applies only to organic, like, like single-celled or insects or plants or animals and mankind, organic life. That's right, but even then, some organisms like viruses are not alive, according to those traits. Right. So that list could be refined, but how does God define life? That's the question, right? We notice that God uses a special term to define some kinds of his creation, nefesh kaya. In Hebrew, this is often translated living creature. Now, this chart shows where it's used in Genesis. God uses the term living creatures to refer to the creatures in the sea in Genesis 1, 20 and 21. It probably also applies to flying creatures mentioned in the same verses. Land-based animals are also called living creatures in verse 24. In verse 30, all living creatures were to eat plants. And finally, in Genesis 2, 7, God created the man, Adam, who is also called by the same term, translated living creature or living soul. Now you can see a few other times where it appears in Genesis there. Mm -hmm. It describes, for example, the animals brought to Adam for him to name and the animals that were brought to Noah to be preserved in the ark. After the break, we'll continue to refine the definition of living creatures and see what makes plants different. 
What does a cow have in common with a compass needle? The answer is that both of them know the orientation of the Earth's magnetic field. No, this isn't crackpot science. In 2008, the prestigious journal The Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences USA published research documenting how cows grazing in a field have a tendency to align themselves with the Earth's magnetic field. And this phenomenon isn't just limited to cows. Many animals, including deer, birds, turtles, bats and even some bacteria, can sense the Earth's magnetic field for alignment or navigation. The fact that so many living things have this ability is rather ironic, considering that the famous evolutionist J.B.S. Haldane once said that evolution couldn't produce magnets. Just as man-made magnetic compasses are the product of forethought and design, so too the magnetic sensing in animals points to an intelligent designer. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. If you appreciate the content, give the video a like, comment, subscribe, ring that bell, and share the video on Twitter and Facebook. Those actions let the algorithms know that you appreciate the content. That's right. So CMI videos will appear more prominently on other people's feeds. Now, you know, the nature of the very good world is fun to think about and explore. But it also has massive implications in, in some surprising areas. Right. Yep. We'll get into those shortly. Well, then let's get back to it. On this week's episode, we're considering how Adam's sin brought death not only on mankind, but also on the animals, which God calls living creatures. So God makes a distinction between the living creatures and at least one other form of life, plants. Yes, yeah. God never refers to plants in, with, with that same term, nefesh kaya. No. Rather, he states that the nefesh kaya, the living creatures, are given plants as their food source. So God defines at least three levels or types of organic life, humans, animals, and plants. Humans meet every part of the definition of organic life, plus a spiritual dimension, the breath of life, which God gave humans at creation when he breathed into Adam. Yeah, nephesh conveys a sense of a breathing creature. It's used throughout the Old Testament to, to also convey a sense of emotions and feelings and consciousness, that, that type of thing. Right. And now, this is similar yet subtly different from the Hebrew word ruach, for example, in uh, Genesis 1-2, meaning spirit, which also carries a sense of breath or breath of life or wind, and, and is also used on occasion in reference to animals. Yeah, and animals, in, in the everyday sense of the word, and humans both possess this life quality. Yeah. It's not the same, since animals aren't spiritually alive in exactly the same sense right. as humans. That nefesh kaya quality indicates that they are soul-like and spirit-like, but without the ability to re relate, to, obviously, directly to God or to understand their place in the universe, that, that right. type of thing. The differences permit us to kill and eat animals, while murdering humans is a terrible sin as well as a crime. Right, yeah. In addition, humans are more valuable than gorillas, for example, mm -hmm. because humans yeah. are made in the image of God. A human can worship God, place faith in Christ, be, be indwelt by the Holy Spirit, an animal can't. Animals and humans share some important characteristics of life, but plants are not nefesh kaya, so they're on a lower level. Yeah, a fourth form of life includes viruses and single-celled organisms like bacteria or amoebas. In Genesis 9-4, God, again using the term nefesh, links that feature of life to blood, which both humans and animals have. Yeah, but insects don't have blood like humans no. and animals, so right. they'd be in a different class of organic life, maybe at, kind of at the same level as plants, that kind of thing? So there are some different levels of life, and we've related some of those to the way God describes life, especially in humans and animals. The article simply titled Nefesh Kaya at creation.com gives more details on the meaning of that term where it appears in the Bible. Yeah, okay, let's take it a step further. Think about the Boston Dynamics robot dog with artificial yeah. intelligence. Boston, Boston Dynamics builds cool robots. <laughs> and maybe one day they'll develop you know, flexible robot appendages like fingers with opposable thumbs and, uh, for, for this robot dog. Mm -hmm. And then this dog could have the ability to reproduce by building copies of itself from the information stored in its dog computer brain, right. you can imagine. <laughs> but even such an impressive robot wouldn't be considered alive. Right. It's only in science fiction that robotic creatures with artificial intelligence become alive and sentient. Yeah, and then things usually get pretty scary. 
like that dog, creatures at the lowest level of organic life operate by programmed instinct. They're, they're organic robots, in a sense. Right. Engineers might someday assemble an entity and, a pro and program it to behave in the same way as a virus or an insect. But humans will never be able to manufacture life forms from raw materials, which the Bible refers to as living creatures. That's right. Yeah, only God can endow a living creature with the breath of life as Adam and Eve and all of their descendants have. The distinction between Nefesh Kaya life and other life that isn't Nefesh Kaya is important for two reasons. Organic life is not a continuum. Mankind and animals did not evolve from some primitive single-celled organism. No. Life forms that are not Nefesh Kaya do not die. Plants, insects, and single-celled life don't die because they're not alive in the biblical sense. Right, yeah. So if, if Eve ate a banana or Adam pruned a tree while right. tending the garden, they weren't killing plants or parts of plants in the same way that shutting off the processor on that, that robot dog wouldn't be roboticide, right. and it wouldn't be like slaughtering a pig or euthanizing a pet dog, for example. So the digestion or decomposition of plants is equivalent to an engineer disassembling a robotic dog for spare parts. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of the same thing uh, for insects as well. If Adam stepped on an ant, it would mm -hmm. not violate the no death before sin principle that we're talking about here. Okay, having defined life, we can now address the question, what is death? Okay. Actually, let's look at evolutionist reasons for how things die. Well, they say that uh, cells fail to make accurate copies of themselves in the growth process. Organisms have evolved a minimum design. That allows them to survive only long enough to reproduce. Beyond that, survival is dumb luck. <laughs> uh, it's difficult to evolve an organism that can last forever, they say. So, mm -hmm. and, and it hasn't happened yet, at least not here on Earth. Right. So. Species that don't die and get replaced can't evolve. And species that evolve will outlast species that don't. And Steve Jobs said, death is very likely the single best invention of life. It is life's change agent. It clears out the old to make way for the new. It is a law of the universe that every living thing must age and die. Okay, so all of these reasons assume that death is natural, it's necessary, right. and it's always been here. When we return, we'll look at what the Bible has to say about death. It's quite different from the evolutionist view. We are commonly told that similarities between living things prove that they are related by evolution. But did you know that many similarities found in nature defy evolution? Take for example the marsupial mouse and the placental mouse. These creatures are remarkably similar, but according to evolutionists, they did not inherit this startling similarity from a common ancestor. Instead, we are told, evolution achieved the same design in both creatures independently. They call this convergence, because evolution has supposedly converged on, or arrived at, a similar looking outcome. But convergence is really just a word used to try to explain away similarities that don't support evolution. Indeed, convergences are so common in nature that they cause major problem for evolutionists, but they fit nicely with the proposal that the living world is the handiwork of a single divine designer. The similarities tell us that there is one mind behind it all. He even designed things in a way that thwarts evolutionary storytelling. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Our subject this week is death. <laughs> yes. We can explain how living things die biologically, but if we ask why living things die, we need to consider more than just biology. Right, yeah, the Bible tells us we die because of sin, right? Yes. It says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sin. Thus, death was not always a part of the universe. There was no death before sin. The curse on Adam's sin not only brought death upon mankind and animals, but it plagued the entire created realm with suffering, decay, and disease. Yeah. As we mentioned earlier, for the creation was subjected to futility, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Now let's consider a few of the things that we see today that are the direct result of our first parent's sin. Children are born with genetic diseases. There are now about 6,000 genetic diseases. Bees sting people. Furnaces break down in the middle of winter. Cars end up as rusting piles of metal. Eagles tear rabbits to shreds to feed their chicks. Sometimes babies die in their cribs. 
We and our livestock and pets, we become sick, experience pain, and eventually die. So death is not natural. No. It hasn't been around for millions of years. It wasn't necessary before sin. And there's coming a time when not only will it be unnecessary, it won't exist. Amen. Death is the last enemy to be destroyed. That's what the Bible says. That, that is a very different role that it, than it plays in the evolutionary worldview, isn't it? That's right. There's a biblical, or, or let's say there's a Christian view of everything, yes. including death. For example, here are some things regarding the Christian view of death that relate to the Christian view of geology, paleontology, the age of the earth, and the theory of evolution. Number one, all sediment layers found around the world with massive quantities of fossilized bones of dead animals must have formed after Adam sinned. Number two, examples of diseases such as cancer and carnivorism found in fossils is evidence of the curse placed on the created realm because of Adam's sin. Number three, fossils were not formed millions of years before Adam arrived on the scene. And so, by the way, that means that dinosaurs did not go extinct 65 right. million years ago. <laughs> Little side note there. The sediment layers containing fossils were laid down during the cataclysmic flood recorded in Genesis 7 and 8 about 4,400 years ago. Right? I, yeah, I mean, yeah. if it, animals didn't die before sin, and this is what the Bible teaches, yep. then the fossils couldn't have been around before Adam sinned. So... The fossil record, which is huge, even miles deep in some parts of the world, yep. must have been formed after Adam sinned. Right. And the only mechanism that could possibly have produced that was a global a flood. Global flood, yep. And if the flood is responsible for the fossil record, then number five, fossils don't provide evidence for an evolutionary sequence of development. Six, which means evolution did not occur. Oh, and that escalated <laughs> quickly. Well, many people cite the fossil record as the main proof for evolution. That's true. But yeah. it's not. Yeah. The writer of Hebrews states, it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. We're all going to die. It's, it's inescapable. We all sin. We all die. Death and taxes, right? Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, we've talked about death very negatively today. Yeah. Uh, but have you ever considered that death is also a blessing? Right. Because after you die, you'll face judgment. Yes. At judgment, there's a possibility that God, the perfect judge, not a corrupt judge, could look at you and see you as someone who not only has never sinned, but loved God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's right. How's that possible? Come to Christ. Come to Christ. Make Jesus the Lord of your life, and when you face judgment, God will see Christ's perfect life instead of your sin. Yep. And you'll spend forever in a world with no pain, disease, or tears. Yeah, everyone sins, but Christ died to pay for sin. The first recorded instance of any death is the death of the animal or animals from which God made garments of skin to cover Adam and Eve's nakedness. Yeah, right, yeah. At, at, at least one animal must have been sacrificed at that point, right? That's right. But this first animal death also had typological significance since it pointed to the sacrifice of Jesus, yes. the Lamb of God, who came into the world to save sinners by dying in our place. Yeah. Now we hope that this has clarified the biblical origin of death and that there was no death of animals before sin. That's right. And you can get a, a free copy of our magazine, Creation Magazine, by going to creation.com slash free mag. And we'll see you next week. And remember, Christianity is an evidence-based faith. And science supports scripture. Thanks to CMI supporters for your financial support. In the meantime, click that like button and leave a comment about what you found most interesting or something new that you learned. Yeah, and share it with someone who might be wondering about this topic. See you next week.